And then the big element is sustainable aviation fuels. So our aircraft can fly with a 50% blend of sustainable aviation fuels today. And we're working to get that up to 100% concentration by 2030. So this is where we as an OEM are doing the research and where we can make a significant difference. So really at Airbus, in terms of sustainable aviation fuels, we want to act as a catalyst for the aviation industry and drive not only our products, but also the whole ecosystem for a rapid adoption of sustainable aviation fuels. And we understand that no one actor can, and no one solution can solve that, uh, solve that challenge. So we need to work together with regulators, uh, with industry bodies, uh, to really find uh, a framework for the deployment specifically of, of sustainable aviation fuels. That's gonna drive half of the reduction in CO2 uh, by 2050, okay? We are here at the IATA World Cargo Symposium in Hong Kong. And from here, we bring a series of conversations with the global leaders from the air cargo industry. And with me in conversation now is uh, Thomas Berger, Marketing Director, Environment and Sustainability at Airbus. Thomas, great to have you for this conversation. A pleasure to be here. Uh, let's talk about sustainability and uh, decarbonization. These are two important uh, topics and priorities for global aviation industry and for aircraft manufacturing. Absolutely. How important are this when you consider from an OEM perspective? Yeah, it's tremendously important. And uh, indeed, we're supporting the ambition of IATA and ICAO for net zero in uh, 2050. And we've got uh, several pillars that, uh, that we're adhering to. So first of all, the new generation aircraft, um, like the one you can see behind me on the background, the A350 freighter. So this is the first new generation freighter uh, coming into the market uh, in 2026. And this is, enables airlines to reduce their carbon emissions up to 40% compared to 747-400 and around 20% compared to 777 freighter. So that's already a big significant reduction for our customers in terms of CO2. And we as an OEM are investing every year around 2 billion euros in R&T to then further our ambitions in terms of technological developments. Um, so we also have an ambition to put a hydrogen powered aircraft into the market by 2035. That's a smaller aircraft, uh, more in the regional category. That's on the product side. And beyond that, we're also working on uh, optimizing operations. So we've got several solutions uh, to make aircraft fly more efficiently, but also be handled on the ground more efficiently as well. So reducing CO2 on the ground. And then the big element is sustainable aviation fuels. So our aircraft can fly with a 50% blend of sustainable aviation fuels today. And we're working to get that up to 100% concentration by 2030. So this is where we as an OEM are doing the research and where we can make a significant difference. So really at Airbus, in terms of sustainable aviation fuels, we want to act as a catalyst for the aviation industry and drive not only our products, but also the whole ecosystem for a rapid adoption of sustainable aviation fuels. Thomas, let's break down the, the four pillars of what IATA has set aside. One is the sustainable aviation fuel, which I think is immediate priority yes. for the aviation industry. Second is the new technologies, and yes. that's where the OEMs come into play. Yes. And the third is the infrastructure, and the fourth is the carbon capture. Or, yes. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so when you look at from the OEM perspective, new technologies, Give us a little more details about what are the new technologies that is coming into play. Yeah, sure. So I think new technologies can be split between those that have been applied to new generation aircraft like the 350 freighter, like the 350 passenger version, AC30neo and so on, and A320neo. And what we're talking about there is new generation engine technology, lighter weight composite fuselages on the A350, and also state-of-the-art aerodynamics. So this is all packaged into our new generation uh, products, which we're selling today. And then we've got what we call the disruptive technologies, which is why we're spending this 2 billion euros in R&T every year. And that's really to push the boundaries. So in that portfolio, you've got things like open rotors, uh, integration of open rotor technology onto our aircraft, hydrogen combustion, but also fuel cell. So we have an ambition to have a hydrogen powered aircraft in the market by 2035. So these are the key elements. Beyond that, we've also got aerodynamic projects like uh, the extra performance wing. We call it to make a very long slender wing to improve the aerodynamics and therefore lower the fuel consumption of aircraft. And all these technologies will come together when they're mature enough and be packaged into an aircraft in the future. So that's a constant process of what we're going through. Product development 
of the new generation, but also disruptive technology to go uh, far into the future. You said about disruptive technologies and the equipment that would come out of the disruptive technology. Yes. What are the kind of timelines that we are looking at? Oh, and sure. when do we see that version of it in the cargo aircraft models? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, this is a very interesting point, actually, because just uh, to mention the cargo market, so mention new generation aircraft. So the A350 freighter is the first new generation freighter. So obviously aircraft have a life cycle of, you know, up to 30 years uh, and even longer, sometimes 40 with a, a second life as a cargo aircraft for passengers, for passenger aircraft. So here we're talking about aircraft that will stay in service for many, many years to come in this size category. For the smaller aircraft where we're talking about hydrogen, I think, uh, first of all, we have an ambition to get our aircraft into the market by 2035. And then let's see how that uh, pans out and how then that is integrated potentially into the freight market. But for now, we're focusing on the new generation products. So really the, the A350 freighter is where it's at. And that will be an aircraft that we're coming into service in 2026 and then flying for many many years to come uh, and then beyond that uh, we've got the passenger freighter conversion markets uh, and we're obviously offering uh, freighters from the small all the way up to the large size p2f a320 a330 321 and uh, and then the dedicated uh, production freighter in the 350 freighter sustainable aviation fuel continues to be a priority uh, we don't have the enough of production for the demand that we have sure. it's going to take a long, long number of years yeah uh, but when when as and when we have the a350 freight that comes out uh, uh, how much efficient will this be in terms of use of the sustainable aviation fuel well the the three all our current products are able to fly on 50 percent sustainable fuel um, so we're working towards getting that up to 100 percent concentration of SAP by 2030, so including all of our, our, our products, our new generation products. So the 350 freighter will reduce fuel consumption, whether it's SAF or, or Jet A1. For the aircraft, whether it's a SAF or a Jet A1, it's transparent, it's to the same standard. And the A350 freighter will burn 40% less than the 747-400. So that's an instant benefit uh, for uh, for cargo operators. Uh, it's something that there is fully in their control uh, because you're right, SAF is a difficult commodity to get hold of today. We want to change that. We want to act as a catalyst so there's more SAF available in the market. Uh, but definitely the new generation will allow airlines to uh, benefit. It's like a natural fuel hedge uh, from um, the escalations in fuel price in the future uh, because SAF is also more expensive. So therefore it becomes uh, doubly more uh, important to have uh, efficient new generation aircraft in their fleets. From your perspective and with whatever the information that you have about the disruptive technologies, what is the future of cargo aircraft look like? Maybe 20 years from now. Well, this is a, yeah, if I had a crystal ball, uh, I, you know, it would be, it would be great, but I don't have a crystal ball. All I've got is uh, uh, insights into the kind of technologies that we're working on. Right now, uh, we have a portfolio. So we've got the extra performance wing for very slender, high aspect ratio efficient wings. Uh, we've got open fan technology. We've got hydrogen uh, technology as well. So uh, I would say it's gonna be like a cocktail uh, of all of these options, uh, depending on uh, how mature they are at the time. So I can't paint you a vision exactly of what that aircraft will look like, but just to say that we're constantly working on uh, getting the most out of disruptive technologies and then maturing them uh, to a level where they will be applied, uh, whether in the packs or the or the freighter market. So I'm afraid I'm afraid I can't directly answer or paint you a picture, uh, but uh, but we be assured we're we're working on it, uh, and it's going to be very interesting for to see how it actually looks like in the end. Hybrid electric to fully electric to hydrogen powered uh, jet. How does that look like and uh, how soon do we see at least the hybrid electric and the electric, fully electric? Yeah, I, th I think this is a very interesting question because um, it, it really, uh, you have to look at the, the different size categories of the market. Today, uh, electric uh, for the commuter category is just about becoming viable with uh, the energy density of, uh, of batteries that we, we see today. So, you know, that's in the range of, you know, up to a 19 seater uh, starts becoming viable today. Uh, that's obviously not in our uh, in our manufacturing domain, so we're producing aircraft from 100 seats and above. Um, nevertheless, uh, we're looking then the next step is towards uh, a regional uh, hydrogen uh, uh, powered or maybe a, a hybrid fuel cell uh, configuration in the 2035 timescale. Okay, that's our ambition. Uh, obviously, we have to mature the technologies, uh, not only the technology on the aircraft, but also uh, the hydrogen ecosystem uh, for combusting hydrogen uh, is, uh, is key to that.
So there has to be an ecosystem with a, a hydrogen provider, an airport which has the facilities, uh, and also then the aircraft. So it's part of a, a larger ecosystem in terms of uh, hydrogen deployment. Uh, and that's a, a, regional, uh, a regional aircraft for medium and, uh, and long haul. Uh, really, we're looking at SAF. SAF is, uh, is necessary. Uh, we wouldn't see a, a hydrogen powered aircraft in that kind of large category uh, until well uh, into the second half of the century. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we use hydrogen uh, and can use hydrogen uh, to produce SAF. So power to liquid fuels, uh, where you synthesize uh, hydrogen uh, with captured carbon to produce SAF is going to be absolutely key. So from an OEM point of view, there's two axes. One is uh, on direct uh, combustion uh, for a smaller kind of aircraft. Uh, and the other is actually uh, promoting and advocating uh, the use of different pathways for SAF, including power to liquid fuels, because by 2050, power to liquids uh, should occupy uh, at least half of the, uh, of, the, of the pathway and the feedstock for SAFs in that time frame. So uh, hydrogen has a dual use uh, for, for us uh, and a big part of it uh, for medium and long haul is related to producing SAF for our larger aircraft. Let me conclude this uh, conversation with your perspective on net zero by 2050. That is the stated aim of yes. IATA uh, for the industry. How optimistic are you about that particular goal? I think certainly there are challenges involved and everyone's uh, re you know, cognizant of that. Um, it's, uh, it's key that, uh, and we understand, that no one actor can, and no one solution can solve that, uh, solve that challenge. So we need to work together with regulators, uh, with industry bodies, uh, to really find uh, a framework for the deployment specifically of, of sustainable aviation fuels. That's gonna drive half of the reduction in CO2 uh, by 2050, okay? Uh, the, uh, the other you know, 40% more or less is coming from technology, latest generation aircraft going into the fleet, uh, and, then, uh, and then disruptive technologies. So uh, I think uh, we, we have the means, uh, the investment in SAF needs to happen today. It's really like almost like an artisanal uh, industry uh, where you have uh, disparate uh, manufacturers and producers of SAF that needs to be scaled up massively. Today, for example, last year, SAF represented 0.2% of uh, all fuel uh, going into, into aircraft. So I, I think that has to be scaled up. There are definite uh, synergies and benefits uh, to uh, those companies and those states who encourage uh, the production and the deployment of SAF, not only in terms of the CO2 reduction, but also in terms of economic benefits that they can get uh, from going in that direction. So uh, I'm very positive. Uh, about uh, about SAF, uh, I think it will happen, but it does need a global uh, a global framework. Um, then the other element is also how to offset the residual emissions. Um, so that's where uh, as Airbus we're encouraging and we've partnered with uh, two companies, uh, Carbon Engineering in Canada and 1.5, uh, to offer as a service uh, offtakes of their carbon dioxide removal units uh, that they're going to be producing actually uh, next year in 2025. Uh, and that we've got three airlines signed up uh, to purchase. So we need uh, a multiple access, so technology, SAF operations, uh, and also CDRs uh, of, of various kinds, whether it be technology-based or nature-based. Uh, but I think in total, uh, we're going in the right direction. Uh, I think 2030 uh, is going to be key. Uh, that's when we have an ambition to have at least 10% uh, SAF uptake in the market. Uh, and that will depend as well on the different states, how they, uh, how they administer that, uh, whether it's bad mandates or incentives, as you have uh, in the United States, for example, uh, and, uh, and how that gets deployed. But it's moving in the right direction. Already uh, last year, uh, in 2023, uh, double the amount of SAF was produced than in 2022. Um, so it's coming, but it still needs a massive amount of investment going forward. Thomas, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. No problem. With pleasure.